Hey everyone, hope you're having a wonderful day. This is your host, Yoshino, and you are listening to Artist Decoded, episode number 162 with director Bao Nguyen, who directed the newest Bruce Lee documentary entitled Be Water, which released on ESPN on June 7th and can now be viewed on the ESPN Plus app. The documentary starts in 1971, before Bruce Lee's superstardom. He returned to Hong Kong to get the opportunities to be a lead actor that excluded him in America. In the two years before his untimely death, which changed the history of film and made him a household name, through rare archival footage, memories of family and friends, and his own words, the story of that time and Lee's prior experiences are told with an intimacy and immediacy that have infrequently been used in earlier tellings of his legend. Growing up and living between the West and the East, Lee was ahead of his time in thinking about the transnational audience. He experienced the racist reaction of an American film industry inundated by a subservient and menacing image of Asian people and learned he'd have to tell his own stories to escape it. This was a really great conversation. We talked about the importance of representation in this episode, and I also found it interesting how much artistic integrity Bruce had, and he had this sense of vision, which carried on throughout his life. But this documentary also showed how human he was and how it depicted his rise to stardom, but also his shortcomings and vulnerabilities and painted a really beautiful picture of Bruce's life on the whole. So without further ado, here's my conversation with director of The Water, Bao Nguyen. Hope you enjoy it. Hey, seriously, thank you so much for taking the time to do this, man. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a while, and I uh, hope you're doing well. Yeah, the world seems like a very different place than when we first saw each other. Totally, yeah. Uh, it seems like in the past, well, I mean, it doesn't seem like, in, in the past couple of months, it's drastically changed. You know, our, our lives, we know it, have been shaped into this different sort of life with coronavirus and all of the social justice and things that are going on within the United States and the protesting. So yeah. How are you feeling about it? Um, it's been, yeah, it's, it's weird to be like promoting something and talking about my project when there's, I feel like so many more important things happening in the world. We, it's just kind of piling on one and at, one after each other. And with the pandemic that was, um, difficult in in many ways just because it's something so unprecedented in our generation and then on top of that with what's going on with uh, you know police brutality which has been happening for centuries but just kind of I think people have been so antsy for lack of a better term and stuck at home and just been wanting to get their voices out there and just kind of scream at the top of their lungs and totally this time with, with the racial injustice and with the protest um, is kind of the perfect time for people to scream out loud and they should be screaming out loud. Yeah. Speaking about your film, Be Water. And, you know, I think there's a lot of parallels between the social injustice issues that were going in Hong Kong during the times in the late, 60s and the early 70s, and also that were paralleled with the social justice movements that were happening in the United States at that time, and also in conjunction with what's going on now. So it's almost a perfect time, in a way, for this film to come out. Yeah, I mean, I hope that the film um, acts as a conversation piece. The, the, The silver lining is that because there aren't that many projects or films or things on television that have this type of representation, you know, someone like Bruce Lee being a hero and um, being a protest figure in his own way, it helps kind of act as a counter narrative to the images that the media is showing on screen in the most, uh, in kind of the beginning stages of the demonstrations where the looting and, 
the minority of protesters that were being presented to society were violent. And Mm -hmm. um, I think representation for me is really important because some, you know, many people are still stuck at home or rightfully so staying at home, quarantining at home because of COVID and their interaction with society is what they see on their television or on their laptops or what they read. And so these represent, you know, these symbols and images of representation have to be, I, I think authentic or at least multifaceted because otherwise um, we fall into this circle of stereotypes and misrepresentations and negative representations that will perpetuate our interactions after the pandemic ends um, and after even the demonstrations end, right? It's mm-hmm. how do we see each other in a way that is authentic and honest? It doesn't always have to be positive, right? It's, but it ha- I think it has to be multifaceted. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, speaking about your perspective as an Asian American, uh, specifically Vietnamese American person growing up in the United States. And like, I'm curious what drew you to wanting to tell stories within film. And as a kid, were you drawn to watching films? Like what was the, the origin of, of all those things? I would say, um, Early on in my life, I always had this curiosity towards the visual, visual arts, visual storytelling. Uh, my parents were Vietnamese war refugees. They left Vietnam on a boat um, and were out at sea for about two weeks uh, before landing in Hong Kong and living in a refugee camp there for six months before finally making it to America. And I was born soon after that. And I never thought I could be a filmmaker or make that my vocation career because I always felt, and this is might be unfair to my parents, but the burden of having to find a stable and lucrative career as either like a doctor or as a lawyer or some other stereotypical role like that. And so um, I, yeah, I never pursued filmmaking, but I I just, I I do remember when I was young, my parents owned like a small business, a fabric store. And uh, my older sister, she would be the one cutting the fabric. And I, at the old age of five years old, would be the cashier. I would be taking the money. And it was funny because people wouldn't, at first, they just see this little Asian boy behind the counter yeah, asking for people to give them their money. Yeah. And they, they would be, they would just like laugh it off. And then I would take the the fabric invoice, the fabric receipt that my sister would write up and I would just ring them up really quickly and they, their minds would be blown. And, um, and, and they, yeah. they, would, they would start tipping me because they, they were so impressed. And I actually put out a tip jar after a few weeks. Um, but I, I bring up, <laughs> I bring up, You learn quickly. Yeah. I mean that Asian hustle, right? You can never get around it. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I bring up the story because uh, this is like the late 80s. There, There isn't iPads. Uh, my parents didn't get me a Game Boy and not many toys. So I was there from like 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. every weekend. And I was just bored out of my mind as a five-year-old. I need a little more like stimulation, right? And so the back of these fabric receipts, invoices that my sister wrote up were blank. And uh, I had like a pen at the cash register and I would take a pen and I would just draw and sketch like all day long. And by the end of the day, the trash bin would just be full of my sketches. And, you know, looking back at it now, I was basically like storyboarding. I was like drawing out these scenes and stories. Um, It it just looked like scribbles, but they were full fledged stories and like myths in my mind. And so that was kind of my like first foray into I guess my artistic side, my visual side. Mm. And I, I mean, we could go longer. I, this, this story is deeper into like how I became a filmmaker, but if we, you know, just, just those are the seeds of, I guess my filmmaking um, interest. Totally. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, we can totally go in a bit deeper into it. So like, did you, I mean, you know, we can even parallel this with Bruce Lee as being, an example of an Asian American or a, an Asian person and in cinema to be representative of people 
such as me and yourself, you know, growing up and watching him on the screen. And, you know, I guess, you know, I'm curious, like, what drew you to wanting to make this particular documentary and how did it come about? I think for me, um, many Asian Americans, um, I wasn't used to seeing people that looked like me on screen. Even if I did see them, they were either playing the villain, the enemy, or the bumbling sidekick or servant. And so when I saw Bruce Lee, I saw Enter the Dragon when I was like eight or nine. It was just me flipping the channels and seeing someone who looked like me through Bruce Lee and seeing him play a hero, playing a leading role. It, it, it was all inspiring. And since then, uh, I didn't go out and kind of like seek every Bruce Lee film, but he, he had become the symbol, this uh, icon of what it meant to be an Asian hero, Asian American hero, and what the importance of representation was. And so I think since then, as I was becoming a filmmaker, I've always wanted to tell stories that look at iconic institutions, individuals in, in a different light, I think as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, it's the, the formation of mythology is really important. Mm. Uh, our role, the responsibility in that, because that's how, again, that's how people are absorbing uh, heroes and the idea of heroism, totally. especially in this generation. And if I can do that through my stories, through my films, then I think that's, that's a noble cause. And also just, again, I think we... We, if we get past this sense of just creating heroes, we have to create multi-dimensional characters, multi-dimensional communities and views of our community because we don't want to be seen as a monolith. We don't want to perpetuate the idea of the model minority either. We want to make sure that we can be seen as someone who has different, that is nuanced, right? That's layered. And I mean, that was the intention behind this film too, is that Bruce Lee is not just a martial artist. He's not just a film icon. He's not just a hero for Asian American representation, but he's a person. He's a human being that died a you know tragic death at the age of thirty two and had a lot of vulnerabilities and um, and insecurities that we all can kind of relate to. Yeah, I mean, I was definitely getting a sense of just understanding his humanity, and it felt like you know that was part of the intention to be able to understand him more deeply and how much he had to fight. Even in the film, Enter the Dragon, I mean, he was essentially fighting for those lines to be able to talk about these philosophical ideas that he had. And yeah, I, I think it was also interesting when you were talking about in the film, how in the Green Hornet, you know, he hit, well, first of all, his pay rate or his pay was significantly lower than Van Williams, but also that he was fighting to even get a couple of lines in. I think there was a letter to a producer and, you know, saying that because he's essentially the sidekick, he should have at least a few lines to be able to express something aside from just the kinetic movement that he displays in the, in the TV show. Yeah, totally. I think, uh, I mean, you bring it up like he was fighting for his lines in Enter the Dragon, and it's like he's literally fighting for his voice to be heard, right? Because, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this is his first film where you can actually hear his voice because the previous films are all dubbed, and he wanted to make sure that there's an authenticity in his voice when he's speaking, that the lines that he's speaking don't feel canned or don't feel contrived. And I think um, that was something that was a bit more revolutionary in his fight for representation because for the most part in Hollywood at that time, it's, it's hard, it's hard for people just to get any roles as an Asian and positive roles too. But he was going beyond that. He's like, I want to write my life. So I want to be the one who uh, yeah. instills my own philosophy into it. And I think maybe that's where the idea that he was arrogant comes from that, he was, he was just kind of pushing that boundary just beyond uh, what people expected an Asian American at that time would, would speak out about, right? Um, because again, with the model minority myth, we're seen as docile, we're supposed to stay in our place and be this 
that's why it's called the model minority myth, but the model of, of communities of color and minorities. And it just pits us against other communities because, you know, with the idea of white supremacy and white adjacency, we're seen as like, okay, because Asians are quiet and they are obedient, um, why can't everyone else be like that too? And Bruce was like, hell no, I'm going to show that I have a voice and that I'm going to speak up and I'm going to, you know, stand up for myself as, as a, as an Asian American. Definitely. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's good also, you know, something that I've been, something that I've been thinking about too, when I was watching the documentary is just the power of saying no to things. And, you know, I mean, I'm sure that you've seen it within uh, working in film and within the film industry and saying yes and no to certain projects, but the no's are generally much more powerful because you're standing up for yourself and what you believe in. And I'm curious, just in general, like, have you always been drawn to wanting to tell stories of racial equality? I would say like, I think my background, because I mean, to go back to the story about like, being try thinking I had to be a doctor or a lawyer. I like pursued becoming a lawyer for a long time. I was born in uh, this really great uh, city called Silver Spring, which was right outside Washington D.C. and it's one of the most diverse cities, like under uh, I think five hundred thousand people or so. And because of that, there's there's a long history of kind of uh, fighting for racial equity and fighting against racial injustice in, in that area. And that has always informed me in terms of like what things that I found important in life. And even when I was pursuing law, I was, I wanted to be like a human rights lawyer or study international law. And yeah, the, my liberal arts background, I was a political science major. I wasn't a film major, at least in my undergrad years, helped me think about the type of stories I wanted to tell and the type of characters and individuals I wanted to highlight in these stories. Then how did you get into film? Like what was the first project? So like the first project was actually when I was like nine years old. Um, Hmm. I don't know if it counts as a film, but it it was the first time I directed something. And uh, it's funny because when I was, I went to NYU and I started when I was 17 I'm like, you went to NYU when you were nine? (laughs) Nine, 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 Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God, man. (laughs) I mean, I'm trying to, I'm jumping back and forth between the timeline, but. No, 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 uh, definitely. I'm just, I'm just being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. I mean, I should just keep that myth going. You're going to like create this myth that I went to NYU when I was nine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We'll cut that part out. And so uh, when you went to NYU at nine. Exactly. Um, So I was 17 when I went to NYU and I I was, yeah, yeah, I pursued law because I didn't think I could be a filmmaker. And I also thought it was too late for me at 17. I was like, oh, there's these other filmmakers like Steven Spielberg who picked up a, you know, eight millimeter camera when they were 12. So I'm like five years too late. And so I'm like over the hill. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I, you know, I eventually took some courses at Tisch, their film school when I had electives. But um, then I, I realized, I don't know when I finally realized that I actually made something at nine. There was a class assignment when I was in fourth grade to sell a product. This is obviously a very American uh, educational endeavors to try to sell a product. And <laughs> it was, yeah. It was supposed to be a written assignment as trying to like draw up like an ad or something. And for some reason, I don't remember why, but I was like inspired to borrow my neighbor's VHS recorder. And I directed like this Nike commercial uh, basically. And I guess that's really the first time I made of a short a video anything on yeah that could be played i suppose i always ask people about their childhoods because it's interesting how these seeds of ideas get implanted in our head and even you know you're talking about living in washington dc when you were young or living adjacent near washington dc and how that shaped your perspective on racial equity and racial equality and also, you know, you're talking about when you're five and essentially creating these drawings that 
could be seen as storyboards. And yeah, I think, you know, there's all these little seeds that get planted and it's interesting to think of like where they come from and why we do the certain things that we do as creative people and what message we're putting out there, which is why I was asking about you wanting to do the film on Bruce Lee. And, you know, I'm curious too, like, you know, during your research for this film, what, what were some of the nuanced things that you learned about Bruce Lee that you previously did not know or that were previously not released to the public? I think a lot of people know a lot about Bruce Lee because yeah, yeah. Uh, he's been around for a long time and there are so many super fans uh, that have been following him for like 40, almost 50 plus years now. And um, a lot, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of footage that people have seen and this is in no means like a definitive documentary, but I found that the stories that maybe weren't told in past narratives were definitely the personal ones. And uh, one of them that really touched me was, or is the story of him and Amy Sanbo, who was his first love in America. Um, mm. uh, she was a Japanese American um, and she was interned at the you know camps during World War II. And I think this experience, this heartbreak that Bruce went through really informed the rest of his life. Um, we were lucky enough to interview her and she hasn't, she hasn't spoken on camera about Bruce Lee ever, just only in, in a print interview, maybe a couple of decades ago or like three decades ago. And so her insight was really enlightening because it just showed kind of the, the coming of age of Bruce Lee. And I think that was an important part of the film is like, we want to feel Bruce Lee and his, his kind of, not infancy, I would say, but sort of his immaturity and how he uh, progressed as a person. And, mm -hmm. you know, when they first met, he had just been in America for a year or so. And she taught him what it meant to be Asian American. He was, he felt very Asian at the time, obviously being uh, raised in Hong Kong, but he wanted to find ways to connect to America, his new homeland, to assimilate to America but she taught him the importance of what it meant to be Asian American, not just Asian, not just American, but it formed that identity, which was an evolving identity for many uh, Asian Americans at that time. But she, I think that sense of pride uh, that she had in her background really informed him being kind of a better version of himself. And he doesn't want to be judged as, as no one wants to be judged by where they came from, what they look like. So he didn't want to be judged as either Chinese or uh, American. He wanted to be judged as a human being. But I think it's important to note that internally we want to have a strong sense of our identity, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah, I think that helps us express ourselves so much more clearly to others and to the world as a whole. And because of kind of this relationship with Amy I think that helped him understand what America was, what how America interacted with mm -hmm. people like him, but also how he was going to interact with America. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I also found that interview, I mean, you know, especially he came to the U.S. I mean, originally he was born in the U.S., but he came back to the U.S. at the age of 18, I believe. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. And then so 18, 19, 20, I mean, those are very formative years for the trajectory of how you are as a, a very young person and for him to have this relationship with her. And I, I thought it was really funny when she was saying, you know, I thought Bruce didn't really have much going on for him or he had a lot to go on for him, but not enough for me. And yeah. uh, <laughs> I just thought that that was really cute and funny in, in hindsight because of how much of a legend he became and such an example of how he became an importance he became to Asian American culture and just culture in general. But yeah, no, I mean, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. You always think of Bruce Lee as this kind of model of masculinity and confidence, but she really, I mean, it was just a funny conversation because she was just like, Oh yeah, I had no regrets, you know, breaking up with Bruce. Like, it's cool that he became who he became, but I, I lived, I lived my own life and that's just, 
uh, just shows her character a bit. And um, yeah, that, that at that time, Bruce was still kind of this awkward, newly arrived uh, immigrant American. When you're saying that, this idea also of, you know, because that relationship could have went a couple of ways for her. I mean, in a parallel universe, which is neither here nor there. But I mean, just to, just to think about it, you know, she could have thought of that relationship as being, you know, having regret of breaking up with him. But there's also this idea of just letting go of things and being okay with the trajectory of your own life and how things go. And I think that informs us a lot of the times on a larger perspective on how to live and how to view life in general. Yeah. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. You're, you're getting deep here, but I don't mind getting deep <laughs> because I haven't, I haven't been getting deep with other conversations, but I think, um, <laughs> this is, this is, this is artist decoded, man. You, you okay, came on God, that, yeah. just, okay. I'm ready for it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's funny you bring that up because yeah, when, I was starting to shoot the film when we were just getting into production. I was coming off a pretty bad heartbreak on my part. Um, mm. And uh, it it's funny how like certain situations have made it like if I didn't go through that breakup, I wouldn't have made this film. I wouldn't have been able to make the film that I wanted to make. And I won't go too deep into it, but there are certain scenarios that happened that allowed me to, uh, that were serendipitous in so many ways. And given like the conversation with Amy and I mean, we spoke with her for like three hours. I would, one day I'll just archive that and post that online. But um, yeah, yeah, she she talked about how he was so adamant about the relationship and she wanted to live her own life, which I, there's a lot of reflection uh, mirroring of, of my experience, but eventually he found his own way. He started to focus on himself and then focus on expanding his martial arts schools. So, you know, it's, it's funny to think like what Bruce Lee would have become if he didn't, if he wasn't heartbroken, if he didn't reassess his goals and reassess what direction he was going to go in. Right. And if definitely if Amy stayed with him, maybe Bruce Lee would just be living in Arizona where Amy currently lives and just having like that ranch type of lifestyle. And who yeah. knows? It's, you know, we can't it, it's all these hypothetical situations are just they make you wonder. But if you can kind of make the most of the path and the present moment that you're living in, then yeah, that, I think that's how you have to kind of live your life and not think about the regret and the what ifs in a way. And just mm-hmm. just be grateful that you're, you know, the moment that you're in right now is the moment that you belong in. Totally. Yeah. And you have to really understand these situations and understand that you can't ever take it personally because especially when it comes to a relationship, it's that person's going through their own thing and they have their own projections and their own insecurities and things that they've been through in life. And, you know, that's not personal to you. It's just, it is, it is what it is. Right. And, you know, what's interesting is I also brought up this idea of just letting go of things. And I was watching the, this film called film worker. Have you heard of it? Um, film No, I haven't. Can you tell me what it's about? I think I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it. It's about this actor named Leon Vitale, and he was in Stanley Kubrick's film, Barry Lyndon. He was one of the main actors, and he ended up, after working with him on the film, he ended up essentially quitting acting, and he started working as an assistant with Stanley Kubrick. And... I bring up this particular thing within this film because the person who played the general, I forget his name off the top of my head, in Full Metal Jacket, he actually essentially took the role, like like actively stole the role from this other guy. And this guy, he was the the helicopter. You know, do you remember the helicopter pilot who was like sh- shooting down on like the Vietnamese like villagers yeah, yeah, in, the, of course. in the fields. How could I forget that scene? 
Yeah, yeah, right. It, it's super intense film, especially being Vietnamese. But that guy, he just the way he was speaking about, oh, that should be my role and this and that. I mean, this is years later. This is like over 40 years later. And I, I'm just thinking about that and just this idea of letting go. And it wasn't a personal thing. It just, he wasn't right anymore for the part. And, but you can really take those moments where you feel so down and you feel that, I mean, even in film, right? Like, you know, you just came from Sundance and, you know, and this is like a big win for you, you know, in January and the coronavirus hits and then there's all these like, social unrest and you know it goes on and on and on and it seems that the whole world is in peril right but what are the the things that you have to take from that and and also understanding that from a, a side of empathy as well you know yeah i think you know i think people um have an opportunity to grow to evolve in different ways right we learn from our lessons in life and i mean one of the best pieces of advice that I got after my breakup is that I kind of wanted to immediately forget about the relationship and think about like who I was before the relationship, even though it was, it was a long relationship, seven years and we were engaged. Wow. And um, my friend who also went through a pretty bad breakup and she was in, in our like friend circle, she's like known as a person to go to when you have a breakup. Cause she just has, mm. she's just like a very calming force. Mm. And um, she was like, don't try to think of who you were before all this happened. Remember how you've changed from it and who you are now. Don't forget about those experiences that you had like for the past seven years because they are formative. And I always, I, I, I really hold on to that advice because I think we don't want to shy away from, you know, our failures, our, our seemingly what we think are regrets. And we want, we want to realize the person that we've grown into at that moment. It, again, I go back to the idea of the present moment because, I, you know, I follow my breath and just kind of follow the tenets of, of Buddhism and meditate when I have a chance. And it's all about bringing it back to the present as much as possible. And yeah, you don't, you don't want to try to like search for this person that you think you were at another moment. It's like, who are you at this moment? And that's again, the only moment that, has impact and that matters in, in many ways that you can control. Definitely. Yeah. And, and it's a, it's a constant reminder too. It's not like immediately you have this spiritual awakening and just everything changes, you know, I think it's a gradual process and, you know, I, I mean, paralleling this with the social injustices that have been happening in America, you know, I think, Immediately when there's protesting and rioting and social unrest, I think a lot of people felt that, you know, they needed to educate themselves or, I mean, you know, there's many ways that you can go about it, but just within my friend circle, it seemed like, you know, a lot of people are trying to educate themselves or, you know, if you're silent, you're apathetic or these various emotions that come with such a traumatic experience. And I think what we have to remind ourselves similar to our spiritual growth as people is that it happens over time. And it's really about this consciousness to be able to change over time and to allow yourself and give yourself the space to be able to learn new things. And change doesn't happen overnight, right? Yeah. And I think that's one of the things I hope people take away with the film, right? Is that yeah, the idea of being water, be water is the title and we're never stagnant. We're always fluid in, in our lives as human beings and in the ways that we interact with the world and in our society as a, as a whole. I, I, I like to think that we're always evolving and uh, Bruce in his life was also always evolving. People think of him mostly as, as a teacher, a teacher of philosophy, a teacher of martial arts. But one thing that I also learned is how much he was a student of, of everyone he taught. His first student in America, Jesse Glover, was a victim of police brutality. And that's one of the reasons that he decided to become a martial artist, to defend himself against like future incidents. And uh, he taught 
Bruce Lee a lot about America when Bruce just came to America. So just like Amy Sanbo informed him of what America could be or shouldn't be, uh, Jesse Glover definitely did that too. And then uh, later on, uh, he was good friends and a student or a teacher, I should say, of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, but he was a student too. And that's that's the point I'm trying to make is that Bruce Lee always felt like he was he was learning and absorbing from everyone he met and in his um his life he always considers himself an artist of life that he was constantly kind of shaping uh where he was going and and his goals and and his destiny in many ways definitely yeah i mean i i i could see that in the film because you guys were talking about how he would learn how to dance from some of his friends or, you know, he'd be able to emulate these movements and also in social settings, you know, they're telling him what's cool and what's not cool. And yeah. And just thinking of the idea of teacher and student, I mean, I think so many teachers, quote unquote, at least bad teachers that I've been (laughs) taught from, but probably didn't listen to as, you know, in my, in my youth, you know, I think, like a good teacher will allow you to be a better version of yourself and inform you in the way and be able to help you find that. And even in, there was this quote in long street and then Bruce Lee was there and he said, I cannot teach you only allow to explore yourself, nothing more. And I think that's it. You know, I think a lot of people and, you know, we can think of just systematic learning, systematic education and how people want to be told what to do. But I think that, you know, this example of Bruce Lee, like I think the reason why he is such a powerful figure is that he is essentially guiding people along for them to see the world for themselves, how they see it allowing their interactions or his interactions in this film, you know, his interaction with people shape him and and be like water, right? You know, it's it's, it's, it's all encompassing, I think. That's something that, you know, the film is very much about Bruce Lee in the present time and Bruce Lee as a person rather than this icon, this symbol. But since he passed away and he's become like immortalized as a 32 year old, I think people have used him as the symbol for self-improvement and just uh, self-determination in many ways, just the significance of how you can improve yourself as an individual, because he was always about improving himself on so many different levels. He was, obviously he was jacked, right? <laughs> just working out. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's funny. There's, there's a funny story that we didn't include in the film just because it's kind of random, but, it could, and also we couldn't just find a visual for it, but, I'll tell you the story of how I forgot who told us, but he would be working out like with a weight in one hand and the other hand, he would have a sandwich. So he would like alternate reps, like take a bite of a sandwich, take a rep of the, you know, (laughs) of of the weight. And I was like, Jesus, like he's being so efficient. And I don't know if that's efficient. I don't know if that's, that's I'm sure insertionists would be like, you should not be doing that. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's really funny. Yeah. It's just a funny image. And I was like, we don't, if we had a photo of him doing that, I'd be like, we're keeping that story in the film, but we don't. So I was like, I'm not going to go out and shoot someone like working out while eating a sandwich simultaneously. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, I'm sorry to throw uh, throw off the conversation. No, bit, no, but. I mean when when you when you when you talk about that, uh, I think about this story that I heard about Arnold Schwarzenegger's father, and he would have him do. I mean, you know, this is like a, a sort of like a, a self discipline thing with Bruce Lee, but you know, with his father, he made him do push ups before he eat breakfast in the morning when he was a child. <laughs> you know, so it's ingraining the sense of uh, discipline, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I, I think for him, it was like this perfect confluence of all his cultures. He's coming from an Asian family and I don't want to perpetuate the stereotype of like a strict Asian, of Asian parents, but he did have a strict Asian father and uh, his father was also in show business. So I think that kind of like coupled with the cultural traditions and also being a performer Bruce, yeah, had that background. 
And then he came to America on his own as an immigrant. So you have like the hustle of being like uh, pushed by your Asian parent and then the hustle of making it as an immigrant in America, right? And this like capitalist attitude that's often perpetuated this idea of like manifest destiny and the, the power of the individual. So I think, yeah, again, those, the combination of those types of upbringings and philosophies uh, made Bruce into this like uh, Voltron of ambition, I guess I would say. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, but but I think you know what's what's really impressive about him too is I mean speaking of capitalism, that in between the Green Hornet and the Big Boss, I mean he wasn't really working that much, you know, because and you know it was like such a devastating thing, the Green Hornet getting canceled, you know, and I mean you can even associate that with growth and you know with with pain hopefully comes growth, you know, if you can understand that for yourself, like what the meaning of that pain is, right, but. It's also, you know, just thinking about that time period for him, it's about that perseverance, you know, that he could have taken on these roles that demoralizes or does, you know, uh, demoralizes Asian American culture, but he didn't because he had what it seems like in the film, it seems like he had this vision of what he was aiming for, you know, and I think that that gets lost in capitalism because it's more so about the accumulation of mon- money and possessions. It seems like that almost, for lack of a better word, trumps. <laughs> that, uh, that's, a, that's a good word to negatively describe it, actually. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now let's talk about... No, I'm just kidding. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that, that, yeah, it's just like the that sort of vision not a lot of people have. And I think that's also why it resonates with people. Right. Him. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that you don't think about when you're thinking about Bruce Lee is like his motivations of what, why he did the things he did. And his, his wife, Linda says that the reason he opened up these Kung Fu schools was that he wanted to show like the beauty of Asian culture of his Chinese culture to the world and to America. I think that's a really beautiful sentiment because Oftentimes when immigrants come over to America, there's a need and uh, uh, this like preconceived notion that you have to assimilate, that you have to kind of give up part of yourself, of your past, of your heritage. And I think it was more so in the past. Luckily, in today's time, it, it's uh, assimilation means it maybe it has different forms. But I think, yeah, uh, yeah in, in Bruce Lee's time, it was like, oh yeah, like go, you have to go learn English and don't speak your native language and just like be white American, the white American cowboy type of figure. Mm -hmm. And he very much wanted to bring part of himself and, and blend that and like mold, I shouldn't say mold, but um, he wanted that to very much melt into American culture, his martial arts, Kung Fu. At that time, um, Kung Fu was still quite new. It's not like today where you see like a martial arts studio, a dojo, like on every strip mall, in every strip mall. Um, So he wanted to use that, his culture, in order to like connect to his fellow Americans, his neighbors, his community. Yeah, that's I feel I find that's a really beautiful sentiment that he's using his you know, sport uh, to, to connect. I think sports and culture, they have such a powerful ability to connect people who are seemingly very different. And yeah, he wanted to just, again, share that to as many people as possible. And later on, he realized that beyond just um, teaching people martial arts and just opening a lot of schools, and he wanted to open like franchises of schools, So he wanted to open up these schools because, I mean, surely there was the idea of wanting to have, you know, sustenance and provide for your family. I think the main reason behind it was to show like a positive image of the Asian, of Asian culture, because he was seeing how Asians, Asian males, Asian American males were being depicted on screen. And that's why he initially, he never had this, desire to become an actor when he arrived in America. He just didn't want to play those roles. 
That's why he was quite surprised when he got that call from uh, William Dozier, who was the producer of The Green Hornet and had mm. previously was producing Batman, which was a huge hit at the time. And um, yeah, he was just surprised that someone would reach out to him. And as he was um, making a career in Hollywood, he realized this the reach of television at that time and you know, up until to the, this day, again, in creating these mythologies and creating these positive, multifaceted portrayals of of people of color, and um, that's why he decided that he's going to get into film, television more. So he had a wider audience for his culture. Yeah, definitely, man. Really quick, I w- okay. So I'll ask one more question because I think our time is running up, but. Do you have any advice for artists and creatives? I would say if you're just starting out, what I found helpful uh, in, in my kind of early beginnings as a filmmaker, as an artist, is to try to find your community that can really be part of your crew that could like help you tell stories that will lift you up and inspire you. And you can also lift up as, as much as you can. And this is something that Lulu Wang told me is to, to network horizontally and not vertically, um, which I think is really interesting Mm. and and helpful because, you know, uh, again, I think it goes back to what I was saying about finding a community. You want to find someone that's like your peers and that you feel like you're growing with instead of like reaching to work with like Steven Spielberg, even though I made a film when I was younger than him. So we won't talk about Spielberg. Um, okay. Okay. But, uh, just kidding. Yeah. Um, which, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but like, yeah, if you're reaching to the people who are, you know, will see you in, in kind of a lower realm, uh, then it's, it's hard to grow. So you want to grow together in many ways. And I would also say if you're just starting out, um, try, I mean, it's helpful and maybe a little easier at the beginning to find stories that you're more familiar with that are part of your personal experience because you have that built in voice and authenticity and honesty to that story uh, already without having to kind of, dive into it and feeling like an outsider. There's something to be said about telling personal stories. It doesn't have to be like literally a personal story, like your voice or you're in it, but something that comes from a place of experience. And I, I always found that helpful in the beginning. Um, familiarity is, is a way to, to get ahead of the curve or just make the learning mm-hmm. curve a little easier. And then later on, as you're building on your craft and becoming more confident, uh, you should take the opportunities to go beyond what's comfortable and what's beyond your own experience, beyond your own life and memoir. The artist, uh, the well, he's an artist, but uh, the Vietnamese American poet Ocean Vuong talks about this mm. idea how a lot of people of color or artists of color, usually after their first few pieces of art, their successful pieces of art, they're expected to to do a memoir or do something very personal and tell their story. And uh, I think for the a lot of reasoning behind that is that we're often expected to be the tour guides to the mainstream culture and to our thinking and our like experiences, because it's kind of this familiar and comfortable way for say a white person to learn about the Vietnamese boat, you know, boat people, uh, quote unquote, experience yeah. <laughs> right yeah. it just makes them you know we're, we're kind of holding their hand and so we're we're expected to be tour guides into our own worlds but we're not allowed to be world builders we're not allowed to be crafts people we're not allowed to be artisans of our own world of a new world and i mm. think that's important that's kind of the next step i think stage of, of representation of authenticity of inclusion and in storytelling is like okay we, we're We've told our history. We've told our our parents' uh, generation story. We helped form that mythology. What is the next step? What is the mythology, the new mythology that we can form for the next generation? Yeah, that's what I, I'm hoping to do in my future work is just give it a chance to world build a bit more. Mm. 
That's incredible. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate you and great watching your film. Yeah, I look forward to um, catching up with you sometime. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm glad to hear you're at the same space. Uh, we won't get into the details of that story, but uh, uh, happy that you're you're like my neighbor now. So definitely when uh, things calm down, I'd love to see you in person, Yoshino. Oh, yeah, definitely, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I appreciate you. And yeah, it was really great. I watched the film a couple of times. And, you know, I, I think what you're doing is is really great, man. And, you know, championing Asian voices. And yeah, so yeah, you did it. All right, man. Great. Well, thank thank you. you so much. Okay. All right. Bye. All right. Bye. Thank you. Music for the podcast is by Rarebit, a.k.a. Justin Dosher Hopkins. Editing assistance is by Noah Wainwright, and intern is Sam King.